Hello and welcome to our seventh lecture on contour integrals. Um, today we're going to learn the Cauchy Integral Theorem. Now soon we're going to learn, learn a Cauchy Integral Formula and it's important that we keep these two things straight. So remember that today we're going to learn the theorem and in a lecture or two we're going to learn the formula and the different things. Okay, so we want to start out by just considering a generic contour integral. So we'll just take our normal contour integral. Well, that's the integral of some function f around some contour c. And now let's express f in terms of its rectangular coordinates. So that means that we're going to let f of z be well, u of x, y plus i, oops, i times v also of x, y. And I guess we mean here where z is x plus i, y. Now, let's also parameterize c in terms of its rectangular coordinates. So parameterize c as um, z of t our normal parameterization, but now we want to break it out into rectangular. So it'll have an x of t and an i y of t. And we've got some range of t. t runs from a to b. Now, if we're assuming c is a contour, which we are, then we know that z of t is differentiable at all but finitely many points. And that means just the definition of that is that the components x and y are differentiable at all but finitely many points. So x of t and y of t are as well. Okay, now we're going to start looking at the pieces of this contour integral. Let's start with that dz. Now, you know, when we do the contour integral, what do we do? We always replace the dz by essentially we're using the chain rule here. We replace it by the derivative of z times dt. Okay, but when we've written z in terms of its rectangular coordinates, we can go up there and we can see that the derivative of, of, of z is nothing other than the derivative of x plus i times the derivative of y. Okay, now, we're going to do something that's a little bit strange. We're going to distribute that dt to both terms here. So we could write this as x prime of t dt plus i y prime of t dt. Okay, now we look at each of these terms, except for the i, and now we see, well, that x prime of t dt is really just a dx. And then we've got an i, and then we've got a y prime of t dt, and for the same reason, we will replace that with dy. Okay, so what have we done? We've taken our dz 
and we've said we can write this as a dx plus i dy, and we're also going to write f in terms of u and v. Okay, so I'm going to scroll up, and then we're going to have the same contour integral, but f replaced with its rectangular coordinates, and dz replaced by dx plus i dy. Okay, so what do we have now? That's what we started with. But we can replace this with an integ integral from A to B, because remember our parameterization of Z runs from A to B, of... Um, I'll expand everything here. What is f? f is u of x, y, but x and y are in terms of t. So really this is u of x of t, y of t, plus i times v of x of t, oops, x of t, y of t, Um, the parentheses are getting a little overwhelming. In fact, I see, I didn't need that parenthesis or that one. Okay, it's a little bit less overwhelming. And now, this is all with respect to dz, but we said we could replace dz by dx plus i dy. Okay, now... This is a, well, it's a strange-looking integral, but we're just going to distribute. So we're going to multiply everything here. There's going to be four terms. Now, we're going to, well, we'll split them into their real and their complex part in a moment. First, let's just do the multiplication, okay? And this time, uh, because we'd run out of space any other way, uh, I'm going to drop these x of t and y of t. In fact, I'm just going to write u and v, and you'll just have to remember that they're in terms of x of t and y of t. Okay. The first term with the first term, we'll get a u dx. The first term with the second term there, we'll get an i u dy and now we go over here we've got an i v times a dx and then plus um, i v times i dy that would be an i squared v dy okay now we're going to split this contour integral into its real and imaginary parts. I've highlighted the real parts in yellow. Let's use green for the imaginary parts. Okay, so this is equal to, let's keep that color coding for now, the integral from a to b of u dx minus v dy plus and now I will pull the i out, i times the integral from a to b, oops, no, that should be in green if I'm going to follow my color scheme here, integral from a to b of u dy plus v dx. Now, so far, everything we've done is true for absolutely any contour integral. But what we've, what we've shown here is that we can write it in terms of a real line integral and if we ignore the i, I mean this is really just i times another real line integral. 
Okay, that's not too much of a shock. We've talked a couple times about how these contour integrals are really two real line integrals with an I on the second one. Okay, and again, this is true for all the contour integrals. Now, let me, in fact, let me unwind the parameterization here. So I'm going to scroll up just a little bit. So really what we've shown is that our contour integral is a real line integral over the same contour, but now we're thinking in terms of the xy plane instead of the complex plane, plus i times also a real line integral, and again, still thinking about the xy plane instead of the complex plane. Now, what do these real line integrals remind you of? I'll give you a moment to think about that. I hope your answer was that it reminds you a little bit, at least, of Green's theorem from multivariable calculus. So this is literally I've taken the way I present Green's theorem out of my multivariable calculus notes. And here's what I mean by remind you about it. Forget about this having a vector field and uh, dotting with a unit tangent. Look at this part though. Here we have a real line integral. Uh, in the physical setting this is you know, this is uh, evaluating the counterclockwise circulation, but also forget about that. Uh, so forget about the vector, the vector field, forget about the counterclockwise circulation, just look here, real line integral, um, p dx plus q dy equals, forget about the fact that it equals a double integral of curl, or even that this is an integral of curl, just look, this, we can evaluate this integral as a double integral over R, where R is the region enclosed by the curve C. Okay, now, we need to read the hypotheses to make sure we can apply this. And in fact, so far we haven't made any conditions on our contour integral, and we cannot apply this. Um, because for one thing, we haven't said that our contour even encloses a region. Okay, so let's read through this carefully. Um, let C be a piecewise smooth curve. Um, next up, it needs to enclose a simply connected region R in the xy plane. And then... The next hypothesis is where P and Q have continuous first partial derivatives in an open region containing R. Okay. These are three hypotheses that we must have. And so what I want to do now is we're going to translate those into R settings and say what do we need to insist that our function and our contour do in order to actually have these hypotheses so that we can appeal to Green's theorem. Okay. The first one is the easiest one. A piecewise smooth curve. Okay, that's that's like our multivariable calculus way to say it. Um, smooth in multivariable calculus, it means the same thing as in this class. It means that the, the curve is differentiable and its derivative is never zero. Okay. Um, piecewise means that, you know, well, this is true for all the pieces. So we can chop our curve up into finitely many pieces that are all smooth curves. Well, we have this if C is a contour. So I'll put a check mark. This is true. 
for any contour C. Okay, well, we're good so far. Let's move on to the second hypothesis. Okay, in closing, a simply connected region R. So our, our first requirement here is simply that our contour must enclose some region. Okay, so what would be bad? Something like this would be bad. Okay, because it doesn't enclose a region. There's the, the beginning and the end aren't enclosing a region. But also what would be bad, even if we close this curve off, by coming back to where we started, that's still bad, because what region did we enclose? What was going on in the middle here? Okay, so not only would we like our contour to be closed, we would also like our contour to be simple. Remember that simple just means that our contour does not cross itself. So the first one would be ruled out um, both because it's not closed and because it's not simple. And the second contour here would be ruled out because it's not simple. Now, assuming that we do have a, s a closed simple contour, do we get this? Okay, let's just look at the definitions we have yet to look at. Will our region be connected? Okay, again, closed and simple just means it will not cross itself, and it'll come back to where it started. Okay, and then that region will be enclosed. And connected says we can get from any one point to any other point via some path within the region. And I hope you can convince yourself that that will be true as long as our contour is closed and simple. Okay, now, so we'll get a connected region. Now, another term we haven't talked about in this course, simply connected. Simply connected, there's a lot of complicated ways to define this, but really it means there's only one path up to um, contraction. But, but more than that, we could, we could really say simply connected just means there's no holes. Okay, what would a region with a hole look like? There you go. There's a region with a hole. Okay. Now, that's a region with a hole. It's, it's, so it's a region that's not simply connected. I hope you can convince yourself that our contour is not going to be enclosing any region with the hole. I mean, how did it jump from the outside line to the inside line here? Okay. So, if we're a close, simple contour, we're going to enclose a simply connected region, and we're fine there. Okay, let me just erase, um, erase all of this, and then we'll look at that third hypothesis, which is a little bit more restrictive even than these. So, so far, uh, notice we just said the first one we get for any contour, the second one we get for a closed simple contour. So. We're adding to our hypotheses here. So far, we need a closed and simple contour. The next one is going to be about our function f. Okay. So, this is our third hypothesis. Um, so, p and q have continuous first partials. Now, what are our P and Q? Well, our P and Q are, 
we had we had two different integrals here. Let's just let's just scroll up and look real quick. Remind ourselves where we are. Okay, our p and q are coming as u there and minus v there and a u there and a v there. Um, in let's see, in the real part, the u is p and the minus v is q and in the complex part so the q goes with dy so now the u is q and the com sorry and the um the v is the other one it's p okay so in one of them p is u in the other it's v and then in one of them q is minus v and in the other one it is u Okay, so it's safe to say that R, P, and Q are, well, they're U and plus or minus V. Okay, so we need U and plus or minus V to have continuous first partial derivatives. Okay, so now I'm going to scroll back up to give ourselves some space. And how are we going to get that? So first, well, u and v must have first partial derivatives, let alone be continuous. So u and v must have first partials everywhere on this region. In fact, everywhere in an open region containing this region. Okay. Well, what are the first partials of u and v? They're the derivatives of u and v with respect to the real and imaginary parts, with respect to x and y. So we will get this if f itself has derivatives. So we get this as if f has a derivative. Now, we have this fancy word for functions that have derivatives, that are differentiable. That means they're analytic. So we need f to be analytic. Okay. Again, in an open region containing r, we're going to get to that in a second. But we need something more than that. We need these first partials not only to exist, but they have to be continuous. Well, that means that we also must have, we also need to have f's derivative to be continuous. That will guarantee that the first partials in Green's theorem are continuous. Okay. So we said that to apply Green's theorem, we need to be our, our contour needs to be simple and closed, and our function f needs to be analytic, and moreover, its derivative needs to be continuous. Now, assuming we have all that. What does Green's theorem tell us? So the question is, assuming that's all true, and we take this real line integral and evaluate it, and then we take the imaginary line integral and evaluate it, what are we going to get? Uh, so let's do those computations. I'm going to scroll up. Okay. Let's just remember what green says. Green says p dx plus q dy is the double integral over the region of dq dx minus dp dy and integrated with respect to area. So usually that would be a dx dy. Okay, assuming this holds, I'll put that in red. 
So assuming we can use this. And we've just worked out what that entails. What does it tell us? Uh, I'm going to look at the real part of our contour integral first. So um, the real part of our contour integral Okay, it's the integral along c of u dx minus v dy. Okay, we've already talked about this here. Our u is our p, and here our q is a minus v. Okay, and then Green's theorem says, that's the double integral over the region enclosed of, okay, it's the partial of q with respect to x. Now, in this course, we, we use a different notation for partials. So, we would write minus v sub x. And then minus the partial of p with respect to y. That would be a minus u sub y. And then this is all integrated with respect to area. Now, we look at the integrand here. Does that cause you to think of anything? Okay, remember, we, we've had to assume that f is already analytic to apply Green's theorem. So we get to use that. And we know something very strong about these, these first partials of our rectangular coordinates for an analytic function. So because f of z is analytic, it satisfies the cauchy riemann equations. Now, there are two cauchy riemann equations. We're going to use them both, but here we only need one of them. And that one says u sub y is minus v sub x. So, take the fact that u sub y equals minus v sub x and plug it into this double integral. And you'll see we end up with minus v sub x plus v sub x. So we're just integrating 0 over the entire region. So assuming that we have the hypotheses of Green's theorem, which in particular means that f of z has to be analytic, and therefore gives us the Cauchy-Riemann equations, then this integral is 0. Okay, it's probably not too much of a shock that the same exact thing is going to happen with the imaginary part of our contour integral, but let's work through it just to see for sure. Um, let me try to erase this to give us room so we can keep the Green's theorem statement up there. So we're going to change this to, that's going to change to the imaginary part. Okay. Okay. The imaginary part of our contour integral. That is the integral of u dy plus v dx. Okay, now we go up, we, we fit this to Green's theorem. Um, now, this time, u is going with y, so that is our q, and v is going with dx, so that is our p. 
So, assuming we have the hypotheses of Green's theorem, we are looking at the double integral over the region R of dq dx, that is u sub x minus dp dy, which is v sub y, all integrated with respect to area. And now we use the other Cauchy Riemann equation. Okay, again, this is because we're assuming f is analytic. The other Cauchy Riemann equation says that u sub x equals v sub y. So that means that our integral up here cancels. So again, we integrate 0 over the region, and we get 0. OK, so we have proved our theorem. I'm just going to scroll up, and we need to remember our, all our hypotheses, and we'll state our theorem. This is the Cauchy integral theorem. Suppose C, our contour, is what we need it to be. It's simple and closed. So it needs to be a simple closed contour. And what did we need on f? f needs to be analytic. On c, and all points enclosed by c. And that it's Derivative is actually continuous there. And then what's our conclusion? Then the integral over C of f of z dz is equal to 0. OK, now there are several points that we need to make here. The first one is, up in Green's theorem, the version of Green's theorem I had copied into, the, into our lecture said we needed actually um, continuous first partials on an open region, uh, open region closing R. Uh, and here I said that only that we're analytic on C at all points enclosed by C. Um, that's, not, that's not really a difference, okay? So um, this would get into open and closed sets, but basically if you're going to have a derivative on this closed set consisting of C and all the points enclosed by it, then you're actually going to have a derivative on some open set that, that includes that closed set. Okay, so I haven't really changed everything. I've just written in terms of C instead of an open region containing C. Okay. The second point that I just want to emphasize, um, because we're going to create some confusion later, this is the Cauchy Integral Theorem. Soon we're going to learn the Cauchy Integral Formula. Uh, the way to keep them separate, at least the way I keep them separate, is that the theorem says that integrals are equal to zero. The formula will give you, well, a formula uh, for these contour integrals when they're not necessarily equal to zero. Um, okay, so this is technically, this is a formula, but this is kind of a boring formula. The Cauchy integral formula would be a lot more interesting. Okay, the final comments I want to make about this is that we already have a hypothesis that gives us this conclusion. 
Okay, so if you remember a couple lectures ago, um, the fifth lecture on contour integrals, we already knew this was true. Okay, and what do I mean by this? That the integral of f along a simple closed contour, we already knew this if f has an antiderivative. So the advantages of the Cauchy integral theorem is only that the hypotheses are different. Okay, instead of assuming that we have an antiderivative, now we just have to assume that we're analytic and that our derivative is continuous. Okay, so those are very different hypotheses and you can hopefully see how they might be more useful uh, because it's easier to check if you have a der derivative than if you have an antiderivative. Okay, now, this is not actually the theorem that we're going to remember though. This is just the theorem that follows, that falls out of Green's theorem. And so we always show you the derivation of this one. But then we're actually going to use a better theorem. So the theorem we're actually going to use is the Corsi, sorry, the cauchy gorsat theorem, which says that actually this whole thing about f prime being continuous doesn't matter. So, I'm going to scroll up and we're going to state the cauchy gorsat theorem. So, this is what happened. Gorsat proved um, that we don't need that condition on f prime. And therefore, we'll drop it to get the Cauchy Gorset theorem. So I'm literally going to write down the same stuff except without that hypothesis. So what did we need? If C is a simple closed contour, and f is analytic, uh, on c, and all points enclosed by c, then our contour integral around c of f is equal to zero. Okay, we're not going to prove this, uh, but the proof is in the book. It's not. It's not beyond our capacity, um, but it's it's significantly more involved than the proof of the Cauchy integral theorem, which just appealed to Green's theorem in in kind of an interesting way. Okay, again, just want to draw your attention to the fact that uh, really our assumption is only that our function is analytic. I mean, we have an assumption about the contours, but, but our big assumption is just that it's analytic. If you replace right here, if you just replace that by f of z has an antiderivative, then you get a result that we knew from the fifth lecture on contour integrals. Right? I mean, that, that fact said, uh, in fact, there was, a, there was a theorem that had the following three things are all equivalent. They all imply each other. And the third one said, if you integrate around a simple closed contour, then you'll get zero if you have an antiderivative. So we've just changed having an antiderivative to having a derivative. Okay. So again, this, this theorem is also true. Well, it's a different theorem if f of z has an antiderivative. Okay, the advantage of Cauchy-Gorsat, just to say it one more time, 
is that it is a lot easier to check if a function is analytic than if it has an antiderivative. To show it has an antiderivative, you have to go find the antiderivative and take its derivative. Whereas to show that your function is analytic, you just have to take its derivative. Okay, let's do some examples. So I'm going to scroll up and examples. Let's start out with the most obvious set of examples, a bunch of integrals that are equal to zero. So for any simple closed contour C, we have the integral of, let's say, sine of z dz around c is equal to zero because sine z is analytic everywhere. It's an entire function. What about the integral along c of e to the z squared? Also zero because e to the z squared is analytic everywhere. That follows from our rules of derivatives because, well, I mean, we can just compute that the derivative of e to the z squared is um, 2z e to the z squared everywhere. Okay? Or, you know, just a polynomial z cubed plus 3z plus 1, let's say, is equal to 0 as well. Now, I will sh tell you the first and the third of these are not really all that exciting. We already knew this. And we knew this because these functions have antiderivatives. So sine has an antiderivative. Um, minus cosine. And then, of course, polynomials have antiderivatives. You can integrate that. Okay, but still, it's even easier to check that they have derivatives. So to check that they are entire functions. And therefore, it doesn't matter where our contour is, we're still going to get zero when we integrate around it. Okay, next let's look at an example where our contour kind of matters. So I'll scroll up a little bit. Um, So, let me state the integral first. Let's say I want to integrate 1 over z squared dz. That's equal, that contour integral will be equal to 0 whenever. Okay, so for what contour c would this be true? Well, we just have to ask ourselves, where is 1 over z squared not analytic? Okay, well, we know what its derivative should be, what its derivative is. The derivative, I'll write it down here, of 1 over z squared. Well, that is minus 2 over z, except that doesn't exist at the origin. Okay, so what do we need? This thing is analytic everywhere but the origin. So we need C to be simple and closed, because we always need that, and we need it not to enclose the origin. So whenever C is a simple closed contour, not uh, enclosing the origin. Okay. Okay, let's look at a slightly more complicated example. Let's change that 1 over z squared to a z to the 1 half. Okay, let me tell you the contour now. 
if C is the unit circle, but I'm going to center it elsewhere. So the unit circle centered at uh, 1 plus I. Um, and I should tell you the orientation and orient it positively. Then, the integral along C of Z to the 1 half dz. Uh, I claim it's equal to 0. I need to tell you what branch we want. Uh, it's just the principal branch. So where Z to the 1 half is the principal branch. Okay, why is this true? Well, let's draw a picture. Our center of our circle is up here at 1 plus i. Uh, you can see that our circle, our contour is going to look like that, oriented positively, so that's counterclockwise. Okay. Now, where do we have problems with this function being analytic? So this is the principal branch. And remember, the principal branch takes the branch cut starting at 0 and going along the negative real axis. So as long as we avoid that ray, then we're analytic. And sure enough, the unit circle centered at 1 plus i avoids that ray. And so we're analytic everywhere, and our integral just works out to be 0 by, um, well, by the cauchy gorsa theorem, or you could actually say that all of the examples we've done follow by the Cauchy integral theorem. You don't actually need Gorsat's improvement on it. Okay, so if you're staring at a contour integral, Probably the first thing you should set, you should ask yourself is, is this integral just going to work out to be zero because I'm integrating my function, uh, I'm integrating an analytic function around a simple closed contour. Let's just, to remind ourselves that this doesn't always work, let's just look at the very first contour integral we ever did. So I'm going to scroll up. If you remember from our second lecture on contour integrals, our very first example of one of those, which is a non-example for the cauchy gorsat theorem, is that if C is the unit circle, um, now I'm, I'm centering it at the origin, um, and it's oriented positively, then the integral of 1 over z dz, well, that's not equal to 0. Okay. In fact, we know what it is. It is 2 pi i, if you remember back to that, to that computation in our second contour integral lecture. And just notice that the, the Cauchy integral theorem or the cauchy gorsat theorem do not apply here because our function 1 over z is not analytic at the origin, which lies inside our contour c. Okay, so we're not allowed to apply the theorems here. And sure enough, we know that we get a different answer. We get 2 pi i. 